the key of David is the very key that David had that caused God to say of him that he was a man after his own heart. But the key to that is centered in the fact that David did not just love God. He loved the Word of God. Amen. Often we have a relationship with God, but we don't necessarily learn that relationship through a systematic daily study of his word. Then it becomes spiritual, it becomes spiritism, where we, we have this relationship with God, but we don't love his word. And we live in a day that I believe that the word and words of God is what has been lost in relationship with God. And often when that then happens, what we then have to do is create an environment of spiritism to draw people so that we create a spiritual environment in church that is often centered around the music, it's, it's centered around the atmosphere, but it's not centered in the book. I believe that God has a lot to say to us. He's written that in a book. I made a statement this week on Facebook that too many Christians don't want to read the book, they just want to see the movie. And often books are written are, are written from scripts that came, I mean movies are written from scripts that came from books. And often the book, if you read it first, it will help you understand the movie. And I think that what many people do is just wait to see the movie and they never read the book. But this is shouldn't be true in the Word of God. We need to read the book. So that we understand the movie and then when you see the movie, you'll know if it's real or not. Or it was dressed up for Hollywood. Amen. So we're in a part of our study, which is the fifth key, which is called the application key. And it is applying the three applications of Scripture. Today we're going to look at a woman called the strange woman. And I'm going to use her to help us understand how to apply the three applications of scripture to better understand how we can look at the word and words of God. Now there are two key women in the book of Proverbs. In the previous chapter, as we were discussing the comparison key, we looked at the first woman who was a key central figure of the book of Proverbs, she would be the Proverbs woman or the virtuous woman or the Proverbs 31 woman as we would call her, right? And I gave you an understanding, especially speaking to our men, of how to know or how to find a woman of virtue. Oh, you can get a cute one. And that don't mean she's virtuous. And God has given us instruction on how to find a, the right woman. How to find a virtuous woman. And to our women, my, my prayer was to help you look and examine yourself to see if you represent a woman of virtue. Now she's a key figure in the book of Proverbs. And we find, find her in Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 through 31. And you remember that this woman, God asked a question. He said this, he asked, who can find a virtuous woman? And we found her in our search as we went through our study. And do you remember where we found her? We found her in the book of Ruth. And we found that Ruth is the book that bears her name. And in one of, it, it is one of, if not the greatest picture of the church, though it is written in the Old Testament. 
And so by comparing scripture with scripture, what we did was we actually learned that in a doctrinal prophetic application, Ruth is the virtuous woman, and the virtuous woman is a picture of that church. But this virtuous woman is also presented in direct contrast to the woman that we're going to look at today. Where there is a woman of virtue who represents the church, there is a strange woman that is also found in the book of Proverbs. The strange woman, when we look in this study, we're introduced to her. So now, let's look at her in light of this key to Bible study called the application key. So from the very outset, I want you to recognize that these two women are diametrically opposed to each other. They're on completely different opposite ends of the spectrum. Other than both of them being of the female gender, there is absolutely no similarity whatsoever between these two women. Now, young men, you're going to find that. But men, you're going to find that to be true of women that generally, you, you don't want a middle-of-the-road girl. But you want a virtuous woman. But what's out there are strange women as well. And she's available to you. We're going to look at her today. And we're going to look at her in detail. Now the strange woman shows up in various places throughout the book of Proverbs. But just as Proverbs 31 is the key chapter that deals with the virtuous woman, Proverbs chapter 7 is the key chapter that deals specifically with the strange woman. And just to begin to give you an idea of what a strange woman actually is, she, had, she is an enticingly, watch this, seductive woman who was seeking to get somebody in her bed. Anywhere you find her in scripture, that's what she's ultimately seeking to do. So first, let me, using the application key, let me give you the historical application of this strange woman. The word historical goes in the blank if you're filling out your notes. So Solomon begins in Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 1, and he says this, speaking to his son. And we, I laid out to you what son, he's writing, he's writing to his son specifically, Rehoboam. Yeah. Explain it to him. But last week we went in detail on how that it is also a picture of the nation of Israel, yeah. who is a, the son of God. Yeah. But it is also a picture of the church, because we are now sons of God. So it's speaking to us. And he says this. He says, my son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with me. Now from an historical perspective, looking back in history as this is written, because this, is this was historically accurate story that was written literally in the book of Proverbs by Solomon to his son. Here is this wise father Solomon writing to his son with what is about to be this. He's going to give him a stern warning to do this, to stay away and guard himself from being seduced by foreign or strange women. If you understand the nation of Israel, one of the things that God told them specifically was not to enter into a relationship with the Gentile women, to stay within the nation of Israel and the reason that God did not want them to go into a relationship with strange women or women outside of the nation of Israel was because they would draw them to
to worship and serve their God. It's the same reason that he tells New Testament people to be not unequal together with an unbeliever. Because the problem is, is that when you have an unbelieving spouse, they will draw you to worship their God. I don't care if it's the TV on Sunday morning. Right. Yeah. Right. You will not see them follow you or go to a place of worship because that's not really where they want to be. And it's just a matter of time before they will draw you away from it. I've seen it now a hundred times. And since this wise father, since he just happens to be the king of Israel, of course, once this was written, it would have been a warning to all young men in the nation of Israel for them to not allow themselves to be deuced, seduced by foreign or strange women. That's a very simple and basic historical application. And it's an easy thing to see and recognize that he's writing this to his son about these strange women. Stay, stay away from them. But, we also have to recognize that the wisdom Solomon is important to his son reaches much deeper than that. I say this because as we're looking at this application of scripture, how to apply a verse, we know that there are three ways to look at it. The second one is the inspirational or doctrinal or devotional application. Proverbs chapter 7 is actually some of the most practical teaching in the entire Bible for every young man and not so young man as well. It's practical teaching in every generation when it comes to this thing of being allured sexually. If I were preaching this chapter inspirational, which is the way that most preachers preach it, I would explain the dangers of dealing with a strange woman and the consequences involved in dealing with strange women. Well, what I want to do is this. I want to take you and I'm going to show you what I mean when, by walking you through an understanding of the wisdom of Solomon in this chapter from a devotional, inspirational perspective first. And again, this type of preaching is what is generally done in most churches on every Sunday morning. Most people teach the inspirational application. In other words, this is what most people do is that they will teach this chapter and they will teach it so that you come to an understanding of how it relates to you and, I, and I'm believing that is a good methodology of teaching the word of God. I'm just here to tell you something. There's a whole lot deeper meaning to what is here and it is what is not taught anymore. And I'm, I'm not going to go through this today but this is the reason I believe why. Because most people have the wrong version of the Bible. Right. Right. And again, unless you, unless you go through our discipleship ministry and you sit down and you go through a systematic way of letting us teach that to you, you'll never understand it. You just won't get it. And you'll look at it and you'll think, there are people who have come here and said, this church is a church that uses one Bible. Something has to be wrong with it. That's 2019. The day that we live in. For those of you who have been through our study, I'm, what I'm saying to you, you immediately go, I get that. But for other people, they go, I really don't get it. And unless you give yourself over to getting it, you'll yeah. never get it. Yeah. Right. Now, I get amens from people who know that. Yeah. But I, I, I know, believe me. So, let me show you how most preachers would preach this portion of scripture. And I'm not going to uh, clown. I'm just going to teach it in an inspirational way. Okay? So let's start with verse 1. And he says this, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with them. Now, inspiration 
basically what he's doing is telling his son this. He's saying this, son, now I want you to listen to me, and I want you to listen to me good. He says this in verse 2. He says, keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple of thine eye. In other words, he said, if you'll do what I'm about to tell you, you'll make these things a priority in your life, and you'll be able to hold on to the things that life is really all about. He says in verse 3, he says, bind them upon thy fingers and write them upon the table of thine heart. He said, son, listen. If you take these truths and you keep them right at your fingertips and etched into the very fabric of everything that you are, then he goes on and says this in verse 4. He says, you'll say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman. In other words, you need to become so related to and intertwined with wisdom and understanding that they become like your sister and your cousin. Wisdom will become your family. And if you do that, son, let me then tell you what it is designed to do. So he says in verse 5, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger, and here's what she does. She flatters you with her words. He says, if you do what I'm telling you, you won't pray, fall prey to the woman of the night who is out there seeking to flatter you with her words to, to, to seduce you to get into her bed. He goes on and says this. For at the window of my house, I look through my case. This is Solomon saying, I'm looking out my door. He says, I mean, if you don't even have to go on a search to see this happen, I can see it happen just by looking out the window of my house. Verse 7 says, And behold, among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. In other words, I looked out my window and I could pick the guy out of the crowd who's going to go down for the camp. <laughs> he says in verse 8, passing through the street near her corner, he went the way of her house. In other words, he's the one who gets as close to the fire as he can get, thinking it's not going to burn. <laughs> verse 9, he says in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. Things are always done at night. Ain't night. <laughs> What's that song say? The freaks come out at night? Oh, yes. Y'all know And he put himself in the midst of this temptation. Watch this. At the time of day when the seduction is at its peak. Verse 10 says, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and sorrow of heart. And even before he knew what happened, there she was, standing right in front of him. She was scantily dressed and with nothing but evil intentions in her heart. Verse 11 and 12 says this. Let me tell you about it. She's loud and she's stubborn her feet abide not in her house. Now she is without, now in the street, and lying in wait at every corner. She's constantly running her mouth and constantly working to get what she wants. And once you find her in the neighborhood, it's like there's no escaping her. She is literally at every turn. He says in verse 13, so she caught him, she kissed him, and with an infinite face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet you, hmm. diligently 
seeking thy face. And I found thee. She says, and so she pounced on her prey by kissing him, wearing a shamelessly seductive face, and making him think that she's that she's simply been out taking care of all kinds of wholesome responsibilities. When all of a sudden, she found him, the man she's always been one of her children. Verse 16 says this. She says, I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and oh, okay. <laughs> she said, come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with lies. For the good man is not at home. He is gone on a long journey. And he taken a bag of money with him. And will come home at the day of home. And oh, how convenient. She said, my bedroom just happens to be so romantic right now. It looks just right. It feels right. It smells right. <laughs> so let's not waste any time. Let's go express our love for each other <coughs> until the morning light. We don't have anything to worry about. Because the man of the house is on a business trip. He, loves he won't be home for several days. <laughs> Verse 21 says this. With her much fair speech, she calls them to eat. With the flattery of her lips, She got him with all her seductive words and he could no longer resist. Verse 22 says, he goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Just like one ox follows behind the ox in front of him straight into the slaughterhouse, he followed her straight to her bedroom. Verse 23 says, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasted to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. He thinks he's going to get, that she's going to give him what he really wanted, but he doesn't realize that in getting what he wanted, he was going to lose what he had. Life as he once knew it is over. Verse 24 says, she says, hearken unto me, thou therefore, children, and attend to my words. This is Solomon in my mouth. He says, O dear children, please hear what I'm saying and hear what I'm about to say. He says, let not, this is Solomon speaking to his sons. He says, let not thine heart decline thy ways. Go, a, go not astray in her paths. Stay away from her. Don't let your heart go down in her ways because what happens is this. The minute your heart goes, your feet's going to follow. Verse 26 says, For she cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Because he let me assure you, he says, you won't be the first life that she's destroyed. She's chewed up and spit out all kinds of men who should have known that. In the end, he comes to verse 27 and says, Her house is the way to hell, down to the chambers of death. She will, let your she will take your life and make it a living hell. She will bring death to everything you really care about. She'll destroy your marriage, your relationship with your kids, maybe even your very life through sexually transmitted diseases. Because she's a heart. And she's on every corner, and she's trying to seduce every man that comes her way. Pretty powerful, isn't it? You read it. Yes. Every man that's reading it <laughs> needs to apply every verse 
to his life in the entire chapter. But listen, that's only a very brief inspirational or devotional application of the passage. It's based only on the historical application. And I can't say enough about all of us making these applications to our lives. In most churches throughout America, in this morning, if a pastor is laying out Proverbs chapter 7, that is the message that he's going to preach. And hear me, God's people are going to be blessed from it. Because if you're a young man and you're out here, or you're a young woman who's a, who's a, who's a, who's a, who's a, <laughs> strange woman. Some of you need to hear that. If, if, listen, I, as, as, as working in the jail, if many of the men who are incarcerated at Jackson County Jail heard how to stay away from strange women, they probably wouldn't be in the situation that they're in. That's right. yeah. Tell Craig to turn that off. Is it cold in here? Yes. yes. Pat, um, anyone other than Pat, is it cold in here? <laughs> Just turn the air on, the fan. Okay? Because I need a fan at least. I'm going through menopause. <laughs> 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 I am Yeah, what am I pausing? <laughs> I know I need some air in here. <laughs> Grace and truth, let me tell you something. If that story is all that we get out of Proverbs chapter 7. We're not in the book in receiving all that God wanted for us to understand it. I'm telling you there's a deeper part of this story. Amen. A much, 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 much deeper part. And unfortunately it is the portion of scripture that most preachers don't they don't preach it because they don't want to preach it. They don't preach it because it isn't being taught anymore. Mm -hmm. And how to look at it. And I'm telling you, is that you may not understand this. Satan is behind it because it reveals who he is. And Satan is behind it and he knew that the way that God was going to reach us was through the word and words of God. So what he's done is that he systematically changed it. And when you change the word, you change the meaning. And we don't study to show ourselves approved under God. What we want is we want the movie. We don't want to read the book. There is a doctrinal application that I want to take you through. So let's look at point C. This is what goes in the blank. It's the prophetic and doctrinal application of the same passages of the scripture. I'm not going to take you verse by verse, but I'm going to give you the key points that you need to understand. <clears throat> so as we've seen, yes, the strange woman is a literal, real, physical woman that, need, that every man needs to take precaution of because she's out here. Every father should warn his child, his son, it's, you know, and again, uh, I, I'm talking to women because, see, we got to keep our women from being strange women. Right? But there's some strange men out here, too. And, and, <laughs> but every person should be guarding their children against the strangers that will come into your relationship to destroy what God is trying to build. Amen. We need to understand that God wants to show us that there is another way that we need to view this woman. So we're still going to use the application key. We're going to apply the three applications of Scripture. We're going to use the comparison key because we're going to compare Scripture with Scripture. And we're going to find out through using the Bible who this woman is as well. Although she's a real physical little woman, she is just also this. She's a spiritual woman. You want to take a picture of this? That's in your notes, actually. The strange woman, here's my key, in the book of Proverbs, 
and throughout Scripture is a picture of the false religious system of Satan. Go a little deeper than just a strange woman. If you don't understand her from the religious perspective, you're going to miss the whole thing that God intended for you to get. Doctrine. So you better get that down in your notes. This is consistent throughout the Bible. For example, in Revelation, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 20, Jesus writes a letter to the church at Thyatira. And he talks about how this church has crawled into bed with a woman by the name of Jezebel. Jezebel, and we, every man in town knows who Jezebel is. She's synonymous with the strange woman. If men will call a woman a Jezebel in a minute. Boy, he'll call her. he get mad at her because she won't put out call her Jezebel. Or she's the one that, all, that everybody knows that's all she do is put out. Come on. We are grown with you. Right? He talks about how this church had crawled into the bed with this woman. And what they end up doing, the church at Thyatira, is that they end up committing spiritual adultery with her. After he com committed this church, I want you to turn, turn to Revelation chapter, chapter uh, 2. Yes, ma'am, or sir, whoever they need to ask me that. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. I want you to, I want to show you what he says about this church. Jimmy, I need some glasses. Thanks, y'all. I'll tell y'all, he got the cool glasses, so. All right. This is what he says. Don't laugh, Jamie. Verse 18, Revelation chapter 2. He says, Unto the angel of the church at Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. Who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like fine grass. Now look at what he says about the church. He says, I know thy works, thy charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. He said, This is what he's saying to them. You guys got this thing figured out. You're doing everything that's right. You're, he said, he said this. He said, you're a working church. You're a church that serves the Lord, right? He said, you're a patient church with people. You have a, you're a faithful church, right? Everybody shows up on Sunday. Everybody knows their place. Everybody does what they're supposed to do. He said, he said, and I know your works. You're in the church. You're in, you're in the mission. You're in the jail. You're ministering to people. You're going to places and you're doing the right things. He says, I know your works. He says, verse 20, though, here's your problem. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you. He said, because thou suffereth or allow that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, do you understand something? This is one of the only places in Scripture that the term prophetess shows up because there are many women who are calling them prophetesses yeah. and what they don't realize is that it doesn't show up in a male gender in any of the other portions of Scripture, but it does in Revelation chapter 2 and it relates it to a Jezebel. Okay, go ahead and call yourself prophetess. Okay. <laughs> if I were you, I'd study the show myself. Amen. 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 Right? right? He said, you call up the call that, well, that Jezebel will cause her a prophet to do, right? And you let this happen. This is what you're allowing her to do. To teach and to seduce my servants to do what? Commit to commit fornication. You do in your church what the strange woman does. <laughs> and to eat being sacrificed to idols. He says, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication and know what her problem was? 
except they repent of their deeds. Oh, there's something there. But it's spiritual, it's not, it's not physical. You want your glasses back there? You know don't I'm, 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 don't, don't let me forget this. <laughs> I need a church pair. <sighs> this woman, I can commit them of being a working church, a terrible church, a church that is serving church, a faithful church, a patient church. And he knows their works until the end. He says this, notwithstanding, I have a few things against you, verse 20, because thou allowest her to teach and seduce you. Now you think for a minute that old Jezebel somehow was reincarnated to come back to the church at Tyre and start having sexual relationship with its members? He's talking about something that, that had happened as people crawl into bed and enter into a relationship with a strange woman spiritually. And in this case, he uses Jezebel as the example. It's a great example of the doctrinal and prophetic application of the strange woman. Now, another great example is found in Revelation chapter 17. It's the first verse opens up to a certain woman. It says this in Revelation chapter 17, in verse 1. He says this of her. 17.1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great poor that sit upon many waters. But do you know who the great whore actually is? She is the strange woman who is sitting on and riding on the back of a scarlet colored beast. The beast, of course, is none other than, watch this, the very Antichrist himself. He's described this way in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's when the Antichrist get destroyed at the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're going to go here. So Y'all hang on. If you don't get it, get the notes. It'll be on video in the morning. Here, the Antichrist is called the wicked. He actually personified in a man or, this is what the Antichrist is. He will be Satan in a human body. Now don't miss that because he is anti-Christ just like Christ showed up in a human body. He is going to show up in a human body as well. Only he will be the anti-Christ, against Christ. Okay? He's called that. And in scripture he happens to have a counterpart called the strange woman in the book of Proverbs. Now there is an historical and inspiration application of the wicked man that you can find in the book of Proverbs too. And you guys that have been here, uh, I went through... Proverbs chapter 1 verse through chapter 10. You can go back and look at the notes. I have a specific sermon that I did on the strange woman and I did one on the wicked man. You want to go back and listen to them. Okay? There's no basketball tomorrow because the team lost. So you, got, you can go through and do it tomorrow on Memorial Day. This man is described in, in Proverbs, and the biblical injunction is that we're to avoid him and to certainly avoid becoming one of them. Now look at, let me give you my, my next point. In the, the doctrinal application, the wicked man 
will always point biblically to a very particular man, the Antichrist, and the strange woman always points biblically, watch this, to the false religious system of this world that are under the power of Satan. Now I'm telling you something that if you're reading your Bible, if you see, every time you see the strange woman, and every time you see the wicked man, you are immediately know that it's not just talking about people, it's talking about a system. If you get that, you'll read your Bible different. You'll view it different. It's how you fall in love with the Word of God. Because you can't just get the inspirational part of it. There's a much deeper story that God is trying to show us. This is the part that either people love this or they don't want to hear it. They only want to hear how it applies to me. I only want to hear how I can stop doing what I'm doing. And I get that. God has much more for you. Amen. So in Revelation chapter 17, the strange woman and the wicked man, this is what happens in 17. They finally find each other. In the book, in Revelation 17. Watch this. Just like Christ has a bride, a bride, a female, called the church, which represents true, a true religious system that he works through, the Antichrist has a bride, too, that represents his false religious system. You know why? Because the Antichrist does everything that he can to counterfeit Christ. Right. Right. Including this. He has a book. As a matter of fact, he has many books. Christ has the book. So why Christ, watch this. While Christ's bride is called a chaste virgin, the Antichrist bride it's called a strange woman. Where to be a chaste virgin, she's called a whore. Now she also in Revelation is, is called the mother of harlots, of prostitutes. Because this is, and, and I'm not going through this, but if you go back to the what I uh, did in Proverbs, I laid the whole thing out, okay? Because this is what she does. She produces other false religious systems mm -hmm. and churches. Mm -hmm. Wow. <coughs> he knows what he's doing. Oh, yeah. God knows what he's doing too. The difference is we don't want to search for the true church. We just want church. That's right. And I'm not saying this as a as a as a misogynistic male. But, but, but in most false religions, you will find, hear me, that they are led by women. I'm not saying that to be negative. They were started by women. You look at the charismatic movement, go back and study who started it and where it started. Amen. You look at Church of Christ, you go to look, look at the seven American cults, go back and study who started them and where they started from. Yeah, I'm just telling you history, don't get mad at me. We don't study history, so we don't ever know. We just think it, we think it's three blocks down the street, so it's a, it says church on it, so I'm, God must want me to go there because I can walk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we end up in churches, but we don't even know what they are. Mm -hmm. I deal with musicians all the time, right, as a musician. And they, and they go, well, I play in five different churches every Sunday. Tell me that, well, one is this Methodist church, and the other one is this Episcopal church, and the other one is this Church of Christ, and the other one is this. And let me ask you, are you Methodist? Well, no, but they pay good. They don't even know what the, they don't know what Methodists teach. They have no idea what a Methodist teaches. They don't even know where Methodist, Methodism came <coughs> from. They have no idea. They end up in a church of Christ or a church of God in Christ. They have no idea where any of it came from. But they go and they link arms with them. And then they look at us and say, well, you're wrong because what you're doing is you're speaking against churches. Like, okay? Because I know that there is a strange woman and a wicked man. And I know that they represent religious systems. 
So you know what I'm going to find out? I'm going to find out what they teach. All right. We don't Amen. live in that day. Amen. We just go to church. We just find a church. We do. <laughs> okay? While Christ has this chaste virgin, the Antichrist has the great horn, Amen. Revelation 17. They have made their unholy alliance, and not just to deceive the world, but to rule the world, watch this, during the tribulation period. Some of you don't know what the tribulation period is, and I, I fully understand this. So let me tell you what it is briefly. It's a seven-year period that's going to take place after the church is raptured out. The church will no longer be here anymore. There will be a seven-year period called the tribulation, and 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 and, and uh, right at the end of the tribulation, Christ is going to come back at what's called the second coming. If you stick around here long enough, if you show up at all, you will learn this stuff and you will learn it and you will know it. Once we see who the strange woman actually is. We're able to come back to the in-depth description of her in Proverbs chapter 7 and see how Satan uses his false religious systems of the world to seduce mankind just like he did to, with the church at Thyatira to commit spiritual fornication with her. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 7 verse 7. He says this when he's starting to he says, and behold among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a man void of understanding. God says this, that this unholy connection with the strange woman happens to simple people who are void of understanding. Because of lack of understanding, people perish. You have to be in a position to learn the scriptures. This is no joke. This ain't about church. We get all caught up in church. This is about learning the scriptures so that you have an understanding of what God is doing today. God would not have you to be ignorant of, of what he's doing. But he needs for you to search the scriptures to find out if these dreams are true. If they think things are, if they be true. So listen, grace and truth. The majority of Christians today, unfortunately, are clueless, not only of who she is, but about where she is. Look at what he says in verses 8 and eight, 9 of Proverbs 7. He said, passing through the street near her corner, he went the way of her house. I just read through this. I gave you the inspiration, but now I'm going to give you the doctrine. He went the way of her house when? In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. Now, this is the way it is doctrinally. Right now, the strange woman is lurking where? She's lurking in the twilight, in the black and dark night. You know what that's a picture of? It's a picture of the church age that we live in today. We can learn an unbelievable amount from Proverbs 7 about what Satan is doing and how he is operating, watch this, his false system of religion in the night time. Now let me tell you why it's called the night time. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, Amen. left the earth, what happened is, is that it went into a state of apostasy. Because the light of the world left. So you know what he did? He left a little bit of light here called the church. And you know what? Satan immediately started attacking it. He immediately started attacking the organism that God intended to be the light of the world, to be children of light in a dark world. And the harlot works best at night. At night. So what she's doing is that she's attacking church systems that are true biblical systems because that is when she does her best work. Paul wanted more and does of our day. Look at what he said in Romans 13. He said the night is far spent. It's just about over. He said the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off 
the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. You know what that means? So here's the thing. When, watch this. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, then what will happen is he will come and he will start what is known as, follow me, little camera, the day of the Lord. I tell them because I'll be looking at the camera and I'll be over here and the camera's still in. <laughs> it's called the day of the Lord. You know why? Because it is the time that the day star comes back. And here's the thing about that day, though. That day lasts a thousand years. You know why that day lasts a thousand years? Because the light of the world will be back on earth and there'll be no more darkness. The scripture says there'll be no shadow of turning within. You know what that means? When it says that, when light comes and it shines, you won't even have a shadow. You know why? Because a shadow casts darkness. And then there'll be light and there is no darkness. Because in him is light and there is no darkness at all. We don't even, that's a little thing about it. Right now, see that dude right there? There he is. He follows me everywhere I go. Because he's casting darkness. Do you realize during the day of the Lord there will be no shadows? Always remember this. It's always darkest before the dawn. And the day star is getting ready to rise. Hear me, he's coming back. And you know what we're in right now? We're in the darkest of the darkest periods. Churches right now, Sunday is a day of, of, of true rest. People at home right now are chilling. They're getting ready for Memorial Day. I guarantee you, Walmart, Javi, they packed. Amen. You can really probably get through the liquor aisles right now. Because they tomorrow's Memorial Day, the start of the summer. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get our party on. Starting now. The pools are opening. It can stop raining. <laughs> it's the day that we live in. It's, this is our period of church history. And it's always darkest before the dawn. And I'm telling you, we are in the darkest period of church history right now. Churches have to put on a show in order to draw people. Uh -huh. They have to put on a circus in order to get people to come. They gotta have the best children's ministries. They gotta have circuses. They gotta have crystal ball. I'm, you might as well put disco lights up. They got stages full of fog and everything. You know, I'm surprised they don't have trapezes and all kinds of stuff. Because that's what makes people come to church anymore. You two start talking about the book. No one is that antiquated book. We don't even believe it's God's word. Hmm. We didn't come for the book. We hmm. came because my cousin over here. <laughs> and that fine chick I've been trying to check out. <laughs> Got my eye on. That's where she go to church at. And that dude, he keep. That's why I'm going to church there. They got some fine girl. You ought to see them fine dudes they got up over there. <laughs> and the thing with the church, the more men that we can choose from. <coughs> Day we live in. It's always darkest before the dawn. Amen. It says this in 1 Thessalonians 5 5. This is our commission. He says, Ye are children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So we need to walk like it's daytime. We're so caught up in this world. It's so sad. Satan is operating at this very moment through false doctrine, through false teachers, and through false religious systems. And just like in the red light district of every major city in the world, in these last days, there is a strange woman on every corner. Because yes. there's a church on every, every corner. There's a church on every corner and people are lured by this strange woman. And you can be assured that Satan knows exactly this. 
He knows how to dress his false system up so that she looks good. He makes sure that she got big stained glass windows. He makes sure that she got all of the bells and whistles to make you think this is what church is about. Look, when you walk through the doors, you hear, um. <laughs> and Satan says, come on in, because I want to seduce you. I'm here to seduce you. I want to get you in my bed. Says this in Proverbs 17. It says, Behold, there met a woman in the attire of an harlot and so of heart. And he knows how, he knows exactly <coughs> how to lead his strange woman to do what? To do this. To use her fair speech of her lips. Look at what it says in verse 21. It says, With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattery of her lips, she forced him. And here was the deal. She wasn't saying nothing. She wasn't preaching the word. Boy, the church said, boy, that preacher sure could preach. Yeah. What he said, I don't know, but he sure knew how to say it. <laughs> Whatever it was he was saying, he sure know how to say it. And we, we, and you know what? We was getting slain in the spirit. Yeah. What he said, I don't know. <laughs> but when he touched me, all he had to do was touch me and I fell out. Yeah. Satan knows how to make his system seem irresistible. It says she caused him to yield. She forced him. Those who are not simple and not void of understanding, however, recognize what God states in Romans 6. Look at what he says in Romans 16, verse 17 and 18. He says, now I beseech you, brethren. This is what he, look at what he's telling us. He says, this is what you're supposed to do. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses. And here's how you mark. The, this is what you, how you know them. Because they'll teach something that's contrary to the doctrine which yeah. you have learned. Yeah. He says, and do this. Avoid them. Well, what you tell me? Why are you speaking against other churches? Because the Bible says that I better mark them that are teaching false doctrine. He says, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And by good words and fair speeches, this is what they do. They deceive the hearts of the self. Because they know how to bring it. They know how to say it in just a way to get everybody up. Everybody standing up. He ain't said a whole lot yet. But they stand up hitting on them. They you know what I'm talking about. Don't you? <laughs> uh, so I hear you. But you know what I'm talking about. Uh, several of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Amen. Right? I went to a funeral the other day. The music started playing. And, and before, no one, this was all music. People would stay. And I'm trying to follow who I'm supposed to do what everybody else would do. They stand in the wall. It was a concert. Ain't nobody singing nothing. It's just the band playing. It was a concert. And it was, it, then one dude started. <laughs> <laughs> and it, 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 I'm not trying to mock this. I'm just telling you that's what happened. <clears throat> was it the Spirit of God leading him? Mm. And I don't, I'm not going to say. I'm not going to be so bold to say that it was. Because I don't want to speak against him. But I, just, I know this, there is a spirit that ain't biblical. The scripture tells me I'm supposed to try the spirits to see if they are of God. Because not every spirit is of God. That's what the scripture says. Satan works through false doctrine to deceive the hearts of the simple. And he's very successful at what he's doing. And he does it by good words and fair speeches. Proverbs 7.21 goes on to say this. It says that with the flattering of her lips, she forced him. And that's one of the things that makes the false religious system so alluring and enticing to the undiscerning person is the fact that they flatter us. 
They appeal to our base nature that always wants us to think that we have what it takes or that there's something that we can <coughs> do to earn our salvation. <coughs> True biblical Christianity, on the other hand, is very clear. And it says this a lot. This is the part of Christianity people don't want. It talks about in Isaiah 64. It says, we are all as unclean things. Yes, we are. It says that in Isaiah 64, 6. He said, well, you know, God, the, here's the problem with sometimes when we read the Bible. Because it, 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 people don't want to read the part of the Bible that, that says that you're a sinner. Amen. And your sin has separated you from God. And it's by his grace and mercy that you can be saved and everything Christ by Christ and Christ alone. Amen. So it makes us want to add something to it to think that we can do something to earn our salvation. Let me, can I let you in on a secret if you don't know this yet? You can't do anything. Jesus paid it all. <laughs> all to him I owe. <laughs> Sin had left a place and stayed. That's what it did to me. And he was. He's the only one who can do this for me. I could, he could do for me what I could not do for myself. Amen. And hear me, I tried. I wanted to do this thing. I wanted to get this thing right. But he could do for me what I could not do for myself. Thank you, Lord. The real Bible teaches the truth, and that truth sometimes ain't, don't, doesn't paint a very good light of us. Whereas Satan's religious system, you know what it wants to do? It wants to flatter you. To make you think that you're okay. Because you know what? We're all good. And we just need to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. <laughs> <coughs> and you and God are the best for you. And He does. But you know what? They're drawing in thousands. But tell some young girl that she's supposed to keep her legs closed. Tell some young man that he needs to watch his little self and, 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 and guard his vessel. People won't hear that. Okay. People won't hear that. God, whereas Satan's false system flatters us, God's truth flattens us. Look at what it says in Proverbs. He says, go on into verse 26. It says, for he hath cast down many wounded, yea, strong men have been slain by her. Have you ever noticed that when people get hurt, or shall we say wounded, by the trials and difficulties of life, they often look to religion to help bring them out of their pain. Realize that? And sad to say, rather than finding the bride of Christ to love and minister by the healing balm of the word of God to them that leads them to Christ, they most usually end up committing spiritual fornication in the bed of Satan's strange woman under a false religious system. It says in verse 26, it says, Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. It's not just trouble, wounded people that she seduces. Many people that our culture would view as successful, strong, are also lured into her bed through her flattery. We'll often hear cultural icons. Hear me. The main ones that get caught up in some of these systems are movie stars, musicians, some of our sports heroes. They talk about how they become, quote unquote, a spiritual person. That's just the way Satan operates. Even people, even people society think that they have it all together and these people are vulnerable to the advances of the strong woman. So let me give you my key point today. Proverbs chapter 7. It's this. In the same way <laughs> men get flattered into illicit <laughs> sex by an alluring physical woman, <laughs> Mankind is easily, uh, is very easily fired into illicit religion by an alluring spiritual woman. That's what this stranger is actually teaching us. And don't miss Satan's ultimate <coughs> I have verses 26 up here first. I'll read it. <coughs> says this in verse 27. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Yes. 
as we talked about earlier, getting connected to the strange woman physically will make life a hell on earth. But listen, getting connected to her spiritually is even worse. Because there's a way of to it that seems correct, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It'll destroy you. You gotta be careful where you go and who you go with. Amen. Don't think for Satan for a second that Satan doesn't have a plan for you. And you know what he's gonna use to get you? Religion. That's how he does it. That's his strongest suit. And you know what? There is a church on every corner because what he's done is that he's made it so that this this harlot is readily available. Every time you turn a corner, there she is. And she is waiting to destroy you. She is waiting to get you. That's true physically, but that's true spiritually. So when you find this strange woman, you need to know who she is. And here's the last thing that you need to pray. Look at what it says in Psalm 119, verse 180. This was David's prayer. He asked the Lord this. He said, open thou mine eyes, that I may behold what he calls wondrous things out of thy law. You know how you do it? You do it by comparing scripture with scripture. Amen. You do it by making applications, the right applications using the keys that open up the Bible to you. So that you can take the word of God and become more than just someone who reads the Bible, but someone who studies the Bible and actually gets something out of it. Here's my challenge to you, and I'll give you a different challenge. If you take your concordance and go through and do a study on the strange woman, and then do another study on the wicked man. And, tell, and come back and tell me what God shows you out of it. Because it's dealing not with a person, it's dealing with a system. God has a lot to say about this. You know why? Because he knows it is the one thing that people who call themselves searching for God are going to go and search for religion. And God, did. Here's the difference with, 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 with the strange woman. Most people search for her <coughs> and they find it. Whereas true religion, you know how we're found? He says, behold, I stand at the door and I not. You don't have to search for me because I'm searching for you. <clears throat> I'm looking for you, and I, all I want is this. If you allow me to come into your heart, if you allow me to suck with you, if you allow me in, and you open the door of your heart to me, I will come in, and we will have an intimate relationship. <clears throat> we will have an intimate relationship, but it won't be burst based off my flattery. I am not here to front. God is not here to flatter us. Yeah, he don't need to make us feel good. Sometimes he makes you feel good by making you observe who you really are. Really are. Amen. 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 Right? Amen. And sometimes we have to look at ourselves. The scripture talks about how that we look into a mirror. Mm. Right? Yeah. And you know what a mirror will always do? You gotta reflect who you are. Here, that's, you know, Dawn and I were in, in, in Atlanta here with a few of our people. And, and, I always talk about that, that that mirror, that magnified mirror. You know what I'm talking about? You have the regular mirror. But then they put the little magnifying mirror, the one where you can pull out tweezers and get real close. Just think if you had one of those big ones. And you got to really look at you. Especially the older you get. The older you get. Well. So. You know what the Word of God is? It's a magnifying mirror. Oh, it gets into the cracks and crevices. It really are. It digs really deep into that. It really will reveal who you are. Here it is. God knows it's not a pretty picture. But what he does is this. He beautifies you by taking Christ and putting him in you. So that now he doesn't see you. He sees Christ in you. And he's, he, he's so glorious. And it's the glory that we have. If you're here today and you don't have Christ in you, you don't know what I'm talking about. So here's the key. You want to have Christ in you. Because he's the only hope that you have. 
And none of us are born with him in us. None of us are born saved. None of us are born saved. We're all born, we're, we're, we're not born in the image and likeness of God. Adam was. We were born in the image of Adam after he fell. And we're fallen sinners. And Christ died for that sin. So that he can make you alive. But that, that, that life is in Christ. Because we, we're walking dead. But we are. It's not a pretty picture. But he'll make you, he'll make you glorious. Let's pray. <coughs> Father Lord, I 